Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. Oh yeah, me again. Hey. I, uh, I'm convinced that occasionally, once in a while, when we get used to hearing the pastor's voice up here, that occasionally you need to hear someone else just so you know how good he is. And I am that person today to remind us just how awesome a preacher we have. Um, and the, the preaching the word that happens here every Sunday uh, when he is here. Um, we are certainly blessed to have him. Um, let's begin today like we have the last few weeks. Uh, this comes from the, the New City Catechism, but these are, are good just to remind us on uh, the, the principles and, and of our beliefs. Uh, today, question nine, what does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? Read along with me. First, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry and do not worship God improperly. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence honoring also his word and works. And the verse that goes along with that, Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 14, read along with me. It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Thank you for that. And those, of course, are probably, I think we have bullets and inserts today with that very same thing. If you couldn't read that, um, it looked fine on my screen yesterday at home, uh, but sometimes it just doesn't translate all that well when you get up here. Second Peter, chapter 3. When we get uh, into... Second Peter in chapter 3, we'll, we'll actually come back to it a little bit later on today. Um, I've got several points to be made today in the next 34 and a half minutes, um, or hour and 34 and a half minutes. Um, one of those kind of things where you throw some things together and you, you try to uh, make the most out. It may take me 15 minutes. It may take me an hour and 15 minutes. I'm not sure which. We'll find out once we get to the end. Um, no, it won't take that long, I promise. The title, How Should We Then Live? If, if you recall, um, and this is the verse, verse 11, this will be our key. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness. Now I'll be having to turn back around here and then to look at this outline. We don't have our screen up here yet, so we'll be working on that still over the next few weeks to try to get that taken care of. So how should we then live? What does that mean? What does a question even have anything to do with? How many of you recognize that name up there? Francis Schaeffer. There's a handful of us. If you remember him from back in the, the 60s and 70s, I won't go into his entire life and his life's work, but one of his works was called How Should We Then Live? He was a Christian theologian, Christian philosopher. Uh, he's one of those that sort of mainstreamed theology and philosophy into the church. That it's okay, we can talk about such things, we can actually talk about uh, the theologians, the philosophers uh, from the last 2,500 years, and, but we can talk about it in, a, in, in the framework of a Christian context. Uh, he created a, a video series, a 10-part video series based on his work, How Should We Then Live, which you can actually stream on YouTube uh, even as we speak. Um, 
All it does is details over the course of the last 2,000 years from the Roman Empire forward to all these um, the high, highlights or the, the low points really of, of civilization and philosophy and, and how that has shaped to where we are right now. And the final question he comes up with, knowing all of that, knowing how culture has been shaped, how theology and philosophy has, has influenced us over the course of time, the final question then is, then what? How should we live? What is our response to that? How should we live? If this happened, then what? If that happened, then what? Now, I know, I, I, I try to make sure none of you fall asleep after I put that little thing up there, logic and conditional statements. Um, this is one of those things, you take a logic class, you take some math classes, this is the if-then statements. If something is true, then X. If, if Y is true, or if X is true, then Y. Uh, and we see these kind of relationships with, with thoughts, with statements, in, in, usually in a mathematical context, uh, but also in a, in a logic context. If, if A is greater than 1 and A is less than 3, then A equals 2. Hey, all right, somebody's paying attention. Um, that is the, the conditional statement. Uh, if this, then this. Um, I imagine there's probably a handful of you even in here, and I know Larry probably is one of them. Uh, computer language. When you look back over the course of uh, time since the computer age, uh, you go back into the 70s and 80s, I remember uh, having the first computer that we had in our school back in the mid-80s, and we would do this basic computer programming. Um, and that is essentially what we were writing in computer code uh, was conditional statements. If you wanted the output to come out like you wanted it to, you had to put in all the factors and all the conditional statements into the computer to arrive at a result. The conditions you put in, if those conditions are met, uh, it would imply a necessary result. Just as in life, uh, a reaction in life certainly more so than at least in, in computer language, a reaction to specific data input, a reaction to stimuli, a reaction to actions. You have action, you have reaction. You have an if, you have a then. We use such simple conditions even when we're raising kids, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> uh, even if... Uh, uh, running business, your work, life in general, we, we learn things based on conditional uh, situations. Uh, to the kids, we try to teach them, if you make your bed, then I won't make you sleep outside again, right? <laughs> oh, that was just me, right? Um, if you make good grades, then this will happen. Uh, at work, if you are late, then you'll eventually get fired. <laughs> um, if you meet your quota, if you don't meet your quota, if you do this, then this. If you don't do that, then that. Conditional statements. The Bible. The Bible sets out many of these conditions. Uh, it sets them out in front of us forces us into recognizing the decisions that we have to make. It boxes us sometimes into corners that says, putting these facts in front of you, that says you will make a decision, you will accept or reject this fact as the condition, and your reaction or reaction to it uh, determines then many things going on down the line. It lays down these definitive truths, these definitive doctrines, puts them in your face with a, with a decision to make. You accept it or you reject it. Our acceptance or rejection of those things is, is evidenced by the results, our actions, 
and our reactions to those data input. The Word of God accomplishes this through many examples in Scripture. It, it does it through direct statements. It does it through commands. But it lays these ifs in front of us. If this is true, then what? Then what? What is your reaction to what the Word of God presents to you as fact or doctrine? So let's take a few looks at these, and I want to present them to you from in this framework. How should we then live? Let's turn to the book of Daniel. Now, I'm going a little old school on you today. I'm going to make you turn into your Bibles that are sitting there on your laps. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. My Sunday school class, this is the part where I expect you to go, ugh. Daniel. Yeah, that's what we're in the middle of right now. Daniel chapter 2. The sovereignty of God. For those in my Sunday school class, the theme of Daniel is God is in control. God is in control. Daniel, the entire book is about God being in control. He's in control of Daniel's life. He's in control of his three friends' lives. He is in control of world history. From beginning to end, God is in control. God is in control. So Daniel chapter 2 kind of starts us off on this. But I want to give you that. If God is truly in control... If God is truly in control as you say you believe, then what? What is your reaction to that fact? We all say God is in control. If that's true in your life, if what you say you believe, you actually believe, then what is your proper response to that belief? And that's where the HW. H-S-W-T, how should we then live? If God is actually in control, and you believe that God is actually in control, then how would you, how should you be reacting to that? We have some examples. Daniel, the entire book, as we said, Sunday school class, God is in control. How should we then live? What is Daniel's reaction to the very fact that God is obviously in control of his life? Daniel chapter 2, 17 and 18. What happens in Daniel chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He doesn't remember the dream. He brings his wizards in, his wise men, his Chaldeans. He brings them in to tell, them, tell him his dream and the interpretation. They can't do it. He gets ready to kill all of his magi, all of his magicians, his Chaldeans. Daniel says, wait, and tells Arioch, we can do it. But what is his first reaction in doing this? Knowing that God can help him, Daniel does one thing. Daniel goes to prayer. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 2 in Daniel. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. We see the same thing when we get to the den of lions in chapter 6. Daniel knew that God is in control, and when the plotters and schemers plotted and schemed against Daniel... His reaction wasn't to stop praying. His reaction was to what? Continue praying. Continue praying. Daniel 6.10. If God is truly in control, as you say you believe he is in control, then you will what? Pray. It is not counterintuitive to pray to somebody that is in fully, fully in control, it is actually intuitive. This is what you should be doing if you believe that God is in control. You would pray to the one who is in control. It also results in praise. Down to verses 20 through 23 of that same chapter, Daniel answered and said, 
Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Prayer and praise. That is a reaction of someone who believes in a God who is sovereign. We also see, let's flip over a page, verse uh, 16 of chapter 3. We also see the three friends faced with the fiery furnace for not bowing down to the idol of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in verse 16 of chapter 3. They respond with boldness because they know that God is what? In control. God is in control. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Boldness, sureness of who God is and that God is in control. They didn't have to worry about the king's reaction. They didn't have to worry about the king's judgment or anger or wrath or that they were getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace. God is in control and they acted like it. They acted like God was in control. The next two verses, trust, verses 17 and 18. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. God is able to deliver us. We trust in God. Verse 18 is key, though. What are those first three words? But if not. But if not. God can save us. God can deliver us. But he might not. But he's still able. And I trust him whether he does or whether he doesn't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we trust in God. Whether he saves us or whether he doesn't, we trust in him. And over to chapter 6 and verse 22. The lion's den. Daniel thrown into the lion's den. Darius uh, attempts to find a way to save him from that through the law. They end up having to throw him in the lion's den regardless. And the next morning, he comes in in verse 20 and says, Daniel, O oh Daniel, did your God save you? Verse 21, Daniel says unto the king, O king, live forever. And here verse 22 is the key. My God hath sent his angel has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Daniel's faith, a response to the sovereignty of God, that God is in control, we see throughout this book and throughout scripture, examples over and over, a response to those who truly believe that God is in control. They will pray, they will praise, they have boldness, they have trust, they have faith, faith. So the question for us is, how should we then live if we believe that God is in control? Isaiah chapter 6. Pastor Steve spent several weeks. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Several weeks on Wednesday nights talking about the holiness of God. God is holy other. Completely different than us. Completely separate from anything we could possibly imagine. He is holy. He is separate. Above. Outside of. He is holy. And his holiness requires a response from us as well. Just as his Sovereignty does. If God is truly holy, as you say you believe, then what? How should we then live if God is truly sovereign and God is truly holy? How should we then live? 
Isaiah chapter 6, we're familiar with this passage, verses uh, 1 through 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And here, what is that reaction? Isaiah is, is before the very throne of God. And the seraphim circling around and crying out what three words? Holy, holy, holy. Isaiah is confronted directly with the holiness of God. And what is his reaction in verse 5? Woe is me. Woe is me. Whenever you see the word woe in scripture, you usually see it in prophetic settings, especially in the Old Testament. Woe is never good news. It's never good news. Woe unto the so-and-so. Woe unto the... Um, I can't remember, I think it's Isaiah, said Chorazin and Bethsaida. Um, woe unto thee, Christ says, whom? Woe unto thee, scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto thee. This is a word of judgment. And who is Isaiah talking about when he says woe? Himself. Woe is me. I am undone. When confronted with the holiness of God, when confronted with who God is, Isaiah's reaction is one of complete and total unworthiness to even be in the presence of a holy God, even to the extent that he pronounces a woe on himself. This is a curse. Blessed be, blessed is, uh, is a blessing. Woe is a curse and it's a self recognition of the unworthiness of being in the presence of a holy god what's his second what's the second uh, necessary reaction verses 6 and 7 then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken let me get those up there <clears throat> which he had taken uh, with the tongs from off the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. After the immediate recognition of unworthiness before a holy God, there's also the recognition for the need of forgiveness through repentance, contriteness, a brokenness that Isaiah has in front of this holy God. And forgiveness is given based on that repentance and recognition of unworthiness. And finally, verse 8, the other reaction to the holy God. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. If God is truly holy, as you say you believe, he is holy. We come to him with a sense of unworthiness. We come to him in a sense of repentance and, and having a need for forgiveness. We come to that holy God with a sense of complete and unreserved obedience. Ready to do his will. Isaiah comes here in verse 5, he is undone. He is woeful. He recognizes just how wretched he actually is, how dirty he is compared to the holy God. And yet, he is cleansed and becomes ready to serve. If you truly believe God is holy, you react as if he is holy. You react with unworthiness, repentance, and obedience. Are you tracking me? All right.
Just make sure I haven't put anybody to sleep yet. Okay. I'm working on it. Third. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15. All the way over to 1 Corinthians. I almost thought, you know, I'll just do everything on this because it's almost Easter. 1 Corinthians 15 is probably my favorite chapter in the Bible. It's all about the resurrection. But there's some things laid out for us in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection that help us to answer this question. How should we then live? If we truly believe that Christ rose from the dead, then what is our reaction? How should we then live? If Christ is truly raised from the dead, as you say you believe, then what? What is our reaction? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15 just in a larger sense um, from beginning to end. I want to focus on the very last verse of the chapter because that is what's going to help us answer this question. But if, we, if you're not familiar with 1 Corinthians 15, read it. Read it through a few times this week, especially leading up to Easter. It's all about Paul's argument for the resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Christ, but our resurrection. Because without the resurrection of Christ, we don't have resurrection. So the point here is Christ rose. The first 11 verses... Are a, are a creed. It's a, it's a listing of, of the evidence that we have that Christ rose again. It's the facts of the resurrection. It's the, the, the beliefs around the resurrection. It's the, the witnesses to the resurrection. Now we see in verses 5 and following, he was seen of Cephas or Peter, and then of the 12, and then 500 at once, and some of those folks are still alive, Paul says, as he's writing 1 Corinthians. Then he's seen of James, then of, then of all the apostles, and then finally in verse 8 he says, then he was seen of me as one born out of due time. These first 11 verses say Christ rose, Christ rose again, and these are the facts, these are the witnesses. Verses 12 through 20 talk about the, how important the fact of the risen Christ is. Verse 14, if Christ be not risen, then what? Our preaching is in vain. If Christ didn't rise, what are we doing? What are we doing here? If Christ did not rise again, Paul says, of course he rose again. And here is why that is so vital. Verses 21 through 34 is a, is a reference to the, the, the failed state of man and then the first Adam and the need for the, the redemption through the last Adam, Christ. Everything that the first Adam failed in, the last Adam, Christ, redeemed and repaired. Verses 35 through 50 is the very nature of the resurrection. How then will we rise again? Uh, the corruptible will put on incorruption. Everything that is earthy will be heavenly. That is the nature of resurrection. What is is not what will be. We will be resurrected. Our bodies will be transformed. Verses 51 through 57 is a revelation of that mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, etc., etc., the corruptible will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality. All these things, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Then we get down to verses 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory because he rose again. And all those 57 verses come down to verse 58, which says, If you believe... That Christ rose from the dead. Then what is your reaction? What is your response to that fact? Verse fifty-eight. Therefore, ah, uh, you know, you know, you've been in, you've been listening long enough in churches and sermons and everything. You know that when the Bible says therefore, you have to see what it's therefore. 
And that's verse 58. Therefore, in response to the first 57 verses, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast, literally, literally refers to being seated. What, what everybody here is doing, you're seated. You're firmly set in your place. Settled, firmly situated. The second one there, unmovable. That Greek word, uh, metakanatos. Uh, it carries that same basic idea of, of steadfast, but it's more intense. Not only are you seated there, you are planted firmly and, and unable to move. Unable to move from what? From abounding in the work of the Lord. You will be firmly set and not move out of doing what God wants you to do. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in God's work. The paraphrase of that verse says, Therefore we should be steadfast, unchangeable, not erratic, not scatterbrained, easily discouraged. We should multiply our good works in the knowledge that the Lord will make them profitable. And that's the key in this last part of the verse. Our confidence in the resurrection Christ's resurrection, our future resurrection. If that confidence wavers, we are sure to our, abandon ourselves to the ways and standards of the world. If there are no eternal ramifications or consequences of what we do in this life, the motivation for selfless service and holy living is gone. But if we are confident in Christ and his resurrection, then what do we see at the end of the chapter? You know that your labor is not in vain. That is why we are steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding. Because our labor is not in vain. Because why? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Oh, five minutes and two more points. Here we go. First Thessalonians, a couple books over. Let's keep going. Salvation. First Thessalonians, chapter 5. I spend too much time trying to talk about the, the context and spending all that time on chapter 15. I want, to, I want you to go to chapter 5 here, but I can't talk about chapter 5 without talking about chapter 4. Because chapter 4 we're very familiar with, aren't we? Yes, the answer to that is yes, Kevin, we are. We are very familiar with chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know those verses, right? The second coming, the rapture. This is, this is given to the, the Thessalonians by Paul as comfort because their loved ones, their, their believing loved ones had gone on they had, they had passed away, and Paul writes these words that you will see them again. Verse 18 of chapter 4, wherefore do what? Comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Then we get to chapter 5, and Paul continues talking about the, the, the day of the Lord. It, it cometh as a thief in the night. He um, says, I want you to understand these things in verse 1. And the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. There's some that will say peace and safety. Then destruction cometh upon them. Verse 4, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness like those. This is a comparison Paul is making. You are not in darkness, but in fact, in verse 5, you are what? The children of light. You are the children of light and not of darkness. You are saved. You are children of God. You have received his salvation. So if God has truly made you the children of light, as you say you believe, how should we then live? Verse 6, 
verse 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. Let's read that verse. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Awake, watching, and sober. If you are saved, one of your reactions is to be ready for his coming again. <laughs> this is the talking about that in chapters 4 and 5. You will be ready. You will be watching. You will be sober. You will be, I mean, that's talking about more than just simply not being drunk. If we look at Ephesians 5 or Colossians 3, and it talks about being sober, being vigilant, as we see Peter also talking about later on, being sober, being serious, being serious-minded, being focused on what is important and not being whimsical and carried away and controlled by other uh, things except for what is the most important, awake, watching, and sober. Verse 8 of that same chapter, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Coming back to pictures that are drawn by Paul in Ephesians 6, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Um, here we see it again, the helmet of the hope of salvation, the breastplate of, of faith and love. In a reaction to our salvation, we are awake, we are watching, we are sober, we are putting on faith and love and hope. Again, those three things, we can point back to 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We are also, verse 11, the other reaction to our salvation. We comfort ourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. If God has brought you salvation, like you say you believe, then you will react with being awake, watching, sober, faith, hope, love, comfort, and edification, amongst a myriad other <laughs> things in Scripture for our reaction. Finally, back to Second Peter. Let's see if I can find it here. And we'll finish up with this. 2 Peter 3. Actually, the entire book of 2 Peter talking about the end times, talking about the second coming. We get to chapter 3, and, and Peter's talking about the end of the end, the new heavens, the new earth, what we see when we get to Revelation chapter 21, um, the new heavens, the new earth. And he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, verse 1, in both which I stir up your mind, pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Scoffers, those that say, so much time has passed, obviously nothing's going to happen. Everything's going to be the same right on through to the end of time. Christ isn't coming back. Um, that's what these scoffers are saying. And, and Peter is saying, that is simply, don't listen to them. <laughs> don't listen to the scoffers. Verse 5, this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, was, that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, verse 7, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. The Lord is coming back. Judgment is coming, Peter says. Just because it's taken a long time does not mean it is not coming. If anything, it is closer than ever before. Verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. The one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And here's that same picture that we get in, in 
1 Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Um, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And here is that verse 11. Well, we started with at the very beginning of this. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? How should we then live if Christ is coming back? If we are truly anticipating the return of our risen Lord to this earth, how should we then live? If he is coming back, as we say that we believe, then does our life, does our conduct reflect the fact that we believe that? How should we then live? Verse 11, the very first thing that we see right there in the end of that verse, holy conversation and godliness attitude, action. We are to be separated from sin. We are to be holy. We are to be godly. We get to verse 14, and we see that it says, diligent in peace, seeing then that ye look for such things. Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace. This is probably referring to peace with each other. Peace with each other. Fellow believers, it also says we are to be spotless and blameless in verse 14. Uh, being able to discern your sin, detest that sin, confessing that sin, just like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, desiring a holy life, abstaining from temptation, uh, faithful in the means of grace, the, the spiritual means of, of studying the word, prayer, worship, maintaining a pure life. And going along with that, verse 18 of the very last verse of the book, growing in grace, maturity through the study of the word and intimate fellowship with him. All of these things, a growing in grace, growing in our salvation, growing in our fellowship and relationship with Christ. If we truly believe that Jesus is coming back, how should we then live? If we truly believe that God is sovereign, that God is holy, that he has saved us, that he has risen from the dead, if we truly believe that he is coming again, how should we then live? That is the question. And the Bible is filled with answers for us on all of those points. We can live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. We do so through prayer, praise, boldness, trust, faith, like Daniel and his three friends. We have a sense of our worthlessness, our unworthiness in the, in the presence of a holy God. Our need for forgiveness and repentance, the spirit of obedience steadfastness, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We are awake, we are watching, we are sober. We pursue a holy conversation and godliness as we increase our relationship and our fellowship with each other and with God. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for, for who you are, for what you have done for us, for the salvation you bring, for the, the resurrection, and the resurrection of, of you and the resurrection that you bring to us in the last days. Lord, we just we thank you for this church, our pastor. Lord, we just pray for the strength, the, the wisdom to, to be able to act as we say that we believe, to be who we say we believe. Lord, we just uh, pray for the, the strength and courage to, 
to get through this day, through this week. And Lord, just uh, teach us. Teach us how we can better be like you. In Christ's name we ask you. Amen.